Welcome to the roundtable in the event of women. My name is Zhu Ping and I am from the University of Oklahoma. I am honored to be the presider of this online roundtable, which brings together eight feminist scholars to celebrate the publication of Professor Tony Ballos in the event of women. Before I start, I'd like to say a few acknowledgements. First, this roundtable is independently sponsored by the MLS Modern and Contemporary Chinese Forum. I thank the other four executive committee members of the forum, Haiyan Li, who was the chair last year, and Nick Edmondson, who is the current chair, Luo Liang, and Nicola Voland. And Professor Ballo's new book, In the Event of Women, was officially released in January 2022. But thanks to the Duke University Press, the eight of us have all received the advanced copies by the end of 2021. So we have read the book and we all have a lot to say about this wonderful book. And uh, last, lastly, the in-person roundtable in the event of women, also sponsored by the MLA's Modern and Contemporary Chinese Forum, has been postponed to the 2023 MLA convention. It will take place in 2023, January 5th to 8th in San Francisco. I thank the MLA organizers for being flexible and accommodating. They, there are eight, eight speakers on this round table and they're arranged in alphabetical order, as you can see from the screen. I will introduce each speaker before inviting her to speak for about five minutes. Then we will have a Q&A session uh, during which we can ask questions uh, about Tony's book and hopefully she can answer uh, most if not all the questions. Um, so the, our first speaker <laughs> happens to be Tony Ballo, Professor Tony Ballo. Uh, alphabetically, she will be the first speaker. So uh, let me give a short introduction first. Professor Tony Ballo is George and Nancy Rob Professor of Humanities at Rice University. She is the author of The Question of Women in Chinese Feminism, published in 2024 by Duke University Press, Inter slash National Feminism and China, published in uh, Japan, uh, Miz uh, Ochano Mizu University Press, and the new monograph in the event of women. She is the editor or co-editor of nine books, including I, Myself, I'm a Woman, Selected Writings of Ding Ling, New Asian Marxisms, Cinema and the Desire, The Cultural Politics of Feminist Marxist Dai Jinghua, and The Modern Girl, Colonial Modernity and East Asia. It is notable that this book is published, was published in Japan in 2020, and it was co-edited with Ruli Ito, right, and uh, Hiroko Sakamoto. Professor Balo is the founding senior editor of the award-winning journal Positions, Asia Critique. Now, without much ado, I will invite Pro Professor Balo to talk about why she wrote this wonderful book. I am deeply grateful to um, Ping Zhu, who initiated and organized um, this panel. Ping uh, contacted scholars who have all contributed in their own way to seeing me through this book. And for that, I also thank her and all of the participants um, who have contributed so much to my scholarly life. I work on problems. You can see that in the pattern I uh, established of writing shorter essays and then working over the years, deciding which insights had merit and which were simply process. Me working out the questions of universality, colonialism, translation or graphesis, for instance. In previous prolonged imaginary debates with Gayatri Spivak, I established that for me, historical detritus um, exceeds our capacity to categorize it, thus the historical catechesis. And I established how the subject of women in Chinese feminism came into shape. The book title I chose was The Subject of Women in Chinese Feminism. The, book, the press insisted that I change it, and I still regret that decision. But having emerged out of the subject problem, I confronted material conditions for how subjects are even possible. 
In many respects, my trajectory is quite general and not individual. Unlike feminist scholar Teresa Brennan, who sought reconciliation of subject and material commodity object in her work, many of us worked our way from the subject of feminism to the problem of women. That is how I see my unfolding scholarship. To me, the modern girl is and was an enduring contradiction and not a solution. As Rudy will point out, even after two initiatives that laid out questions in the study of the modern girl phenomenon, I felt the need to push further. That is when I began to consider whether natural scientific truths were in fact truths of another historical order. If a discovery is irrefutable, humans are mammals, then it forms an irrefutable truth so far as we can historically know truth or care about evolutionary much. But do philosophy helped me address my question, which is, how is it possible under given social, economic, intellectual conditions to be an ovarian woman? Since I came to believe an, in, an event is a politically inspired action to install a newly discovered truth, the widespread acceptance that physiology describes humanity opened a historical pathway to me. Women's political emancipation, it turned out, revolved around the physiological and sociological question to square a circle, to figure out how men and women are both equal and different. As I note in the book's preface, I published meditations on these core problems until such time as I could develop the general critique in which history is the touchstone and universal truths demonstrable. I have been drawn to continental philosophy my entire scholarly career. The incitement, however, has always been to understand universalizing claims in a non-European language, Chinese. Like Chinese feminisms, Chinese social theory is social theory. But a drama wraps around universal claims, arriving in linguistic interpretation into a target language itself in revolutionary turmoil in the work of interpreters engaged in high stakes political and sometimes outright armed struggles. Decades ago, we debated whether European feminist philosophies could be applied to Chinese women. The answer in the longer term is no, since it is not possible to apply philosophy. But my question in this book became as much, how is Chinese sociology sociology as how is bio woman event in history? I spent time finding, reading, and analyzing social science initiatives at new Chinese universities and in intellectual political circles, seeking to understand the practical theorization that consolidated the bio woman's appearance on the horizon of, of history, to use Meng Yue and Dai Jinhua's lovely phrase. In this process, commercial ephemera became to me philosophically legible in environments that colonial modernity built. That said, philosophy or theory is neither microscope nor telescope. As the Benjaminians have argued among others, philosophy helps scholars locate and rest out truths that are imminent or latent in old things or foundational to our contemporary social field. Intellectual historians take seriously forms, but also the content of explicit and implicit arguments generalizations, universals, and eventually common sense cliches. Whether the argument concerns the role instinct plays in society, or whether discouraging peasant mobility and relying on land-based entitlements rather than market-based choice is correct. This is a fiery theoretical debate in current Chinese govern governance theory. Debate is not superstructural because it translates into voluntarist action and thus disturbs the environment. This proved to be as true of Li Da and He, he Yinchen as it was of Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg. Since graduate school, I have also fetishized evidence. I knew and I know that the sources do not speak for themselves. Like many historians, however, the detritus is magical to me. I never weary of staring at photos or articles about the ABCs of sociology or society or lists of translations and social science facts. Scopophilia, my love of staring at evidence, perhaps under the delusion that is staring back at me, even things I don't understand led to compulsive collecting. When I set out to write this book, it was going to be about the history of sociology. 
So for me, being overwhelmed by the evidence is reassuring. And having a functional database, courtesy of my collaboration with Professor Chen Jing, of commercial ephemera assures me that the preponderance of the available historical evidence is clearly with my argument. It is a riddle, this obsession with tiny bits of ephemera in relation to huge generalizations about the rise of human society. But this part seems particularly important to me and it is an in instigation I continue to pursue. I believe that scholars who purport to understand universally should read my book just as I read theirs. The point I make, however, has to do with interior debates in the areas that are home to me. My objective with allies and comrades is to figure out how new things come into the world. When it can be established that they do, then making other new things is feasible. Sharing the fact that new things are achievable outside the provincial world of US scholarship is also a good feeling. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Barlow, for providing the important context of your persistent intellectual pursuit. Uh, over all these years, you've been uh, trying to tackle this very difficult problem on the subject of women, and uh, we, we are so glad to read your new book. And so next, our next speaker is uh, Ruli Ito, who actually is the person this book in the event of women is dedicated to. Uh, and so. Uh, professor Ito is currently Professor of Transnational Sociology and Gender Studies at Suda University in Tokyo. Her areas of interest include gender, migration, citizenship, and uh, domestic work. In the 2000s, together with Tony Barlow, uh, Professor Ito took, pa uh, took part in launching a transnational MOGA, or Modern Go, studies network, which led to the co-edited volume in Japanese, The Modern Go, uh, Colonial Modernity, and East Asia, I just mentioned before when I introduced Professor Barlow. Um, Professor Ito is the, also the uh, co-editor of several volumes in Japanese, including International Migration and the Chained Gender, the Globalization of the Realm of Reproduction, Feminism in Japan, Globalization, and Caring on Gender Studies. I particularly wanted to thank Professor Ito for joining us in the early morning from Tokyo. So ido san please. Thank you uh, very much for the kind introduction and uh, thank you very much for organizing this panel thing. Okay, um, congratulations, Tani, uh, for bringing this book to fruition. I'm deeply honored and humbled to see the book dedicated for me, to me. Not many people get this privilege. Um, I assure you it is an overwhelming feeling. So thank you. I wish to take this opportunity to tell you how I came to know Tani and how, in my view, this book, at least part of it, is linked to Japanese scholarly community. It was in late September 2000 at a limousine bus stop in Ikebukuro that I first met Tani with her late husband, Donald Lowe. They had just arrived from Seattle Tani came as a visiting professor at the Institute for Gender Studies, IGS as we call it, at Ochanomizu University, which is a uh, principal hub for gender studies in Japan. I was still new to IGS. I had arrived only in April that year and was told to coordinate her seminars. Um, in terms of discipline, Mine was sociology, not history. Also my field of expertise was France, not China. So I had some doubts about whether I was really qualified for doing this task. Anyway, after leaving the luggage at the guest house, we went for a bite at a nearby restaurant and I asked them whether they cared for a glass of beer. I saw a huge, big smile on both faces. I asked them whether, uh, well, th this thing that I, you know, discovering that we all discover, uh, love beer was a really an accomplish accomplishment for me that day because it gave me optimism about the work ahead. Um, that year, Tani was to give six lectures from early November to mid December on inter-national feminism in China 
every week she would bring um, her text very tightly woven, which I would study dictionaries in hand to prepare myself for consecutive translation. Um, there were words like, how do you pronounce it? Catechrisis <laughs> that I actually really didn't know at that time. So that was, you know, a lot of work and uh, challenging for me. The seminar started at 6.30 p.m. and ended around 8.45 p.m. Um, so despite these late hours, many scholars, not only Japanese, but also Chinese or American scholars based in Tokyo would show up. Um, about 50 to 60 of them. And this was quite exceptional uh, to have so many participants, you know, for these seminars. Each session there was a discussant such as late Takemura Kazuko, a feminist theoretician and a literary critique, um, or Sakamoto Hiroko, a historian of modern Chinese thoughts. Tiny stimulating lectures uh, followed by their comments led to very vibrant discussions, sometimes three languages in the room. And these sessions would often end with a happy post-seminar post beer <laughs> session. Uh, the month of December 2000 was also marked by the Women's International War Crimes Tribunal on Jap Japan's military sexual slavery held at Kudankaikan, Tokyo. All of us listened in silence to the testimonies of former uh, conflict women. Outside the venue, amassed extreme writers shouting hate speech. Uh, I think we have very vivid memories of this and it was a very intense time. We were in the event of women on a world scale. It is impossible to describe in you know, these few minutes about how Tani's scholarship has impacted Japanese academia, but I will just say two things. First, after her stay, a modern girl study group was launched at IGS with a large scale funding from uh, JSPS, which is Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, this one focused on East Asia. Uh, and this uh, international project, including a uh, Chinese scholar, a uh, Korean scholar, Taiwanese scholar, this project yielded an edited volume, which Ping just mentioned in Japanese under the title of Modern Girl and Colonial Modernity in 2010. It led to a cascade of many other modern girl studies. And I saw that just even the, uh, last year in March, there was a, a symposium organized on Modern Girl uh, by um, French Japan Institute here in Tokyo. Um, second, as a migration scholar myself, I cannot overlook the potential value the idea of uh, colonial modernity has had for migration studies. It's been important for my own research on Okinawan Modern Girl, but also for Matsuda Hiroko, who is a historian, whose recent book uses this concept to com comprehend the significance of micro-migrations between Okinawa and Taiwan during the pre-war period. Her book was published just last year. So this time in this ambitious book we celebrate today, I find many familiar themes that she has been exploring in the past 20 years. In the event of women leaves me with the sensation that all the scattered pieces of a huge puzzle have finally come together, revealing a new perspective on the becoming of women's subjectivity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Ito, uh, for your interesting story and 20 years, more than 20 years of love, a long friend, uh, friendship between you and uh, Tony, and also for uh, giving us this uh, very important 
uh, a piece of puzzle, which is about how Tani's, uh, uh, the, how Japanese academia actually played an important role in Tani's intellectual development over the past 20 years. So I actually did not know the book was dedicated to you before I invited you on board. So I, I'm glad I did. I just heard about Tani talking about you. I, I knew you were important to her. So that's why I invited you. So thank you very much for the talk. And so our next speaker is Rebecca Kao, is a professor of history at New York University. She is the author of Staging the World, Chinese Nationalism at the Turn of the 20th Century, Mao Zedong and China in the 20th Century World, a Concise History, The Magic Concepts, History and the, Econom and the Economic in 20th Century China and China's Revolutions in the Modern World, A Brief Interpretive History. Professor Kao is a co-translator together with Professor Zhong Xueping, who's also on this round table, of Cai Xiang's Revolution and its Narratives, China's Socialist Literary and Cultural Imaginaries, 1949 to 1966. She also co-translated and co-edited with Lydia Liu and Dorothy Ko, The Birth of Chinese Feminism, Essential Texts in Transnational Theory. Professor Kao, the virtual podium is now yours. <laughs> Virtual podium. Okay, yes. well, hello, hello, neighbor, Tani, and congrats uh, on uh, publishing the book. It's no small accomplishment, as all of us who have written books know very well, that uh, publishing a book is not a, is not a small thing. Uh, thanks, uh, Ping, for putting this together and keeping us on track through the various uh, permutations of this panel. Uh, I'm really glad that we'll be able to uh, reconvene in 2023 and drink a beer together <laughs> or many beers together. Um, uh, I too, Rory, have uh, uh, discovered uh, Tani's love of beer. We have a uh, Harlem beer, ho uh, Harlem hops right around the corner here that we have started to frequent uh, when, uh, when Tani's in town. In town. So um, I'm... Uh, I'm really pleased to be able to reread this book. I read it uh, uh, early on uh, in order to provide a blurb for the back cover. Uh, and as we know, for blurbing purposes, things uh, you don't read very closely, you just read, you know, episodically. Um, but uh, my comments, uh, however, are gonna be relatively brief and more in the vein of questions that I want uh, to engage us all in and particularly want to uh, hear what Tani might have to say. But I just, I, I, the way into my questions is really, is to, is to think about, um, is, to, is to narrate slightly in a, in a way how I read this book um, this time. And I read the book without reading the introduction. I dove directly into the chapters um, without the mise-en-scene of Tani's uh, stage directions, okay? Um, and, uh, and I have read the intro before, um, uh, but that was some time ago and it didn't stick completely because it, uh, I, I was doing it in a rushed fashion. So, the trip uh, this time into Tani's mind uh, that this book invites us to take, the trip into how Tani thinks, which layers one fragment onto another, moving sideways and upways and downways and uh, with each next piece of analysis and information. The experience of the method was, I confess, very annoying, um, very exciting. And ultimately, I realized very necessary. Um, and uh, in this reading, the anti-narrative aspect of the book's method struck me more forcefully than ever before. Uh, Tani's refusal to narrate, the refusal of narrative as even a crutch, if not only as an explanatory, but even as a heuristic, as any in any form whatsoever, uh, is frankly infuriating and refreshing at the same time. Um, so there were times as I was reading the book over the past week uh, that I wanted to throw the book across the room and say, you know, fuck this, excuse my language. Um, uh, but, uh, and then uh, there were times, and then I picked the book back up knowing that I had this panel that I had to answer to. 
Uh, so, uh, so the disciplinary aspect of reading uh, reasserted itself. But uh, so that the infuriating nature of it uh, often gave way to the refreshing nature of it. And so I'll select refreshing here rather than infuriating, uh, since it seems to me clear that the fragmentary way of building the argument mimics or performs precisely the historically fragmented mode of how the event of woman is inaugurated. And it's admirable, Tani, that you um, maintained that throughout, you did not um, lapse practically at any point um, into some a more easily uh, sort of uh, 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 realized method. The resistance to narrative then presents rather than represents the material in its riotous multiplicity and inarticulate expressivity. And I'm almost convinced that the event cannot be narrated although it clearly can be televised in advertising mode. <laughs> Sorry, I had, to, I had to get in a 60s reference there somehow. Um, but this refusal to narrate provokes a question or questions, and I'll just add, I'll end my remarks with just a few, a few questions. In part, these questions are prompted by the end of the book, which ends up with history as the solution to philosophy. Uh, which with I agree wholeheartedly, although still not without any narrativization of the event of women. So I guess one of my questions, which is very simple and straightforward, is that many historians would argue that events are narrative processes, um, or they are narrated in the, in the aftermath and become events in their narrative aftermath and so on. I know that's not Badia's notion of the event, so I'm not gonna ask you to square that circle. Okay, but, I, but still, I want to insist, perhaps stupidly and perhaps stubbornly, that history forces us to order time and temporalities. And if you're gonna end with history, as you do, as a solution to philosophy, uh, that somehow narrative has to be accounted for. Um, uh, and I can see you smiling, so. Um, it's a good question. Uh, so I, I want you to, I would like us to think about the temporal flattening that takes place once the event of woman happens. In other words, what, what it, it seems to remain there for the picking enduringly as such. And while I take that point and I think it's important, my question is how to how do we historicize that event then? And not necessarily particularize it as Chinese or otherwise, but how do we historicize it? How does it move through time? Or how do we think time or temporality in that sense? Another question, similarly simple, I suppose, and this uh, is a follow on to the first question is, are all political events or events that are deemed political in the sense that you are thinking of the event mm -hmm. and, all, and are all of their truths equivalent? As simply then, why is your event of women more important than another, for example? Or why is this the event uh, 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 it, in which we are situated? And you could, of course, return this to the purely biological. Without women, there is no species being, there is no humanity, but obviously that's not, that's not a good answer. And that can't be the answer. So what does one do with commensurability and equivalence as a historical uh, problem? Um, and I'll just leave it there. I have other questions, but those are my two biggies and uh, they're stubborn and simple, but uh, I think get to the core of the methodological uh, aspects that make the book rich, exciting, infuriating, and refreshing all at the same time. 
Thank, thank you very much, Professor Kao, for this wonderful remark. And I, I'm sure the problem of anti-narrative can be discussed uh, even in 2023, right, during our in-person meeting. So uh, Professor Kao asked two questions, but uh, Tony, you don't need to answer them now. Uh, let's save all the questions to the Q&A session after all the remarks from the panelists. So, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next speaker, Suzy King, who is Associate Professor of Korean History at Rutgers University. Her monograph, Everyday Life in the North Korean Revolution, 1945 to 1950, uh, won the James B. Palais Book Prize in Korean Studies from the Association for Asian Studies in 2015. She is currently working on the gender history in North Korea during the post-war period. She has been an advocate for human rights and peace in Korea as the Korean country specialist for Amnesty International USA, as an advisory board member for Choose Foundation and as uh, in Seoul, Korea, and as an executive committee member of Women Cross DMZ. Professor Kim, please take the virtual podium now. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you, Payne, for organizing this amazing panel of women. I'm, I'm super deeply humbled to be in the company of, of, of all of you. And um, I'm not quite sure how to follow Rebecca's act. Um, I think that's, <laughs> very, <laughs> that's a very, very difficult act to follow. Um, I do have some prepared remarks. And so I'm just, I'm gonna just, um, just rely on that. But wow, um, you know, the, the book blew me away and then Rebecca's questions blew me away even more. So now I'm just, kind of floating somewhere um, in the in the ether um, out there. But um, the way that I prepared for the panel today and, and my remarks really just had to do with the way that Ping framed the panel um, and the question that was posed to us, as far as I understood it, was how to reposition feminist critique historically in light of the vision methodology and the arguments in this book. And, and we're supposed to answer all that in just five minutes, which I thought was a challenge in and of itself. Um, I might have to go a little bit longer than that, but um, I think the best way that I thought about addressing this question was just sharing my own intellectual journey um, and what this book helped solve for me. And I did not actually have the benefit that Rebecca did, you know, have, to have like multiple readings of the book. Um, I had discussions with Tani about some of the issues, but I, I, I did not have the privilege of actually reading um, drafts of the book before. So this was my first, I got to spend this winter break um, you know, <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, tackling this book. Um, and I was, I was um, Rebecca's remarks that, you know, it was both infuriating and refreshing. I think um, I, I, that really resonated with me. Um, but partly just because I felt like I was such a, well, you'll see in my remarks why in a moment. But uh, Tani makes note in, in one of the end notes of how I myself got involved in some of the issues raised in the book through a conference on communist feminisms that Tani organized um, at Rice back in 2012. Um, and even as I worked on a culmination of some of this discussion for a special issue of the Positions Journal, that was just recently published in 2020, I have to confess now at this, you know, in this forum that I was really rather unhappy with the kind of conclusion that I ended up drawing in my own contribution to that special issue. And now I understand why um, after having read in the event of women. Um, in my piece for that special issue, I had compared the white haired girl from China and the flower girl from North Korea to argue against the, era the so-called erasure thesis. That is to say um, that state socialist women's femininity and sexuality were not erased by the communist parties in those countries as class overruled genders as, uh, gender as is commonly claimed. Tani had, um, has, um, has used this metaphor already and, and Rebecca made note of it also, um, but I also needed to square the circle of how pro-woman policies still left unanswered the woman question. How is it that women were deemed equal to men and yet difference persisted? I ended up with a rather pat and trite, although I hope not unimportant conclusion that the state socialist attempt to deal with inequities privileged social unity through family relations so that non-oppositional identities like worker, peasant and youth 
took primacy over gendered identities and women were identified as mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters alongside their identities as workers, peasants, and youth. As an antidote to this limited way of dealing with the woman question, I had suggested um, in that piece, in that earlier piece, that the dilemma of difference um, ought not to be overcome by appealing to unity, but by embracing difference. Well, I wish I could have had this book back then so I could rely on Tani Barlow rather than resorting to Julia Kristeva and Simone de Beauvoir. I say this because while I could diagnose the problem that was introduced by the category of gender as a kind of displacement of sex and feminist theorizing that then depoliticized women as a historical subject, I didn't know where to go at the end beyond citing Beauvoir's famous quote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. So I ended up with a question um, by, or that is to say, I ended with a question by asking what models of personhood and communality can embrace differences to lay to rest essentialized categories. In other words, I didn't know what to do with the event of women. The book answers this question of gender difference through a resounding drop the mic moment that in fact, conflicts do not revolve around polar opposites. Um, this Tani makes note of in, in, towards the end of the book on page 223. The vernacular framing of this dilemma, um, at least in the way that I understand it, usually happens through the nurture versus nature debate. Are women born different from men as women or are they socially made into women? While this rendering is admittedly simplistic, it has been at the center of feminist critique and women's organizing throughout the long 20th century and in different ways continues to be relevant today in LGBTQ plus organizing when activists must resort to arguments about being quote, born this way. Reading in the event of women felt to me like a process of whacking away at the weeds to cut through the needless opposition between biology and sociology by showing how the emergence of women was a political event that encompassed both the birth of women's, women as biologized beings through evolutionary theories and the birth of women as social beings through sociological theories and that these two processes were intimately connected. Um, as Tani says in the conclusion, there is no either or here. Well, no wonder I had such trouble squaring the circle since the mystery of organic sexual difference has never fully been resolved. Um, that I'm quoting again from Tani's conclusions. So, um, and here, oh, in the next line to that sentence, um, felt direct, directed personally at me. It was as if when I was reading that part, it's like when you go to a stage play and like the actor says something from the stage and for whatever reason, it comes piercing at you and you feel like it's like a command or, or an advice that's directly straight at you. That's what it felt like for me. I think this was on page 226. Um, because, and it felt directed at me because I've always had in some ways a difficult time acknowledging the body, both in my personal life and in my scholarship. You know, I end up sitting at the computer for hours and end up don't move and I completely ignore my body to my detriment, I find. So that next line is, um, in, in some ways a command to me, is this, quote, not only is there nothing to be gained by demonizing the rise of the anatomical body newly discovered in the past century, but the drive for sexuation, so it's another one of those words that I had to learn, like um, Ruri was saying earlier, uh, with cata catacresis, I think, also for me that I had to learn. Um, the drive for sexuation is intimately connected to the gynecological order, whatever one calls it. Um, and, and, and a little bit further on, um, in the last page of the book, she goes on to say, or write, if the biological body of a woman is alleged to be ahistorical, then historians will pursue the idea that anatomy is a naive puppet that culture or psychic drive drives clothe subjectivities that change over time, but merely historically. Only when women's historians and historians as such 
recognize a political event of women in modern times, will the mystery of gender be resolved? Um, that um, to me just, you know, it kind of, it, it really pierced uh, me because in doing away with the nature nurture binary in this way, the book's method of looking at ephemera, not as representations, but as manifestations of a political struggle gets us back to women as subjects, not as latent participants in the event, not an impossible category, these are all Tani's phrasing, but as eventual in her struggle to assert a natural right to be human. Thank you, Tani Barlow. Thank you, Professor Kim, uh, for, for taking your time to respond to what I framed in the proposal of this roundtable. And I think uh, you are the uh, Korean historian and Tani Barlow is a, a Chinese historian in a way, or East Asian. But uh, I think your unique contribution proves that uh, the book in the event of women should be read by every feminist gender studies scholars, not only the Chinese or uh, East Asian alone, right? The methodology is universal, okay, and important, uh, ground, uh, groundbreaking. So thank you very much. And let me move on to our next speaker, Nicola uh, Spakowski. She is a professor of sinology at the University of Freiburg, Germany. Her research is dedicated to 20th century and contemporary China, in particular, the concepts of time, approaches to history and the future, feminism, women, women's studies, and the history of socialism. She is the author of a book in Germany, its uh, English translation is Courageously to the Front, Women's Military Participation in the Chinese Communist Revolution, 1925 to 1949. And she is the co-editor of Women in China, the Republican Period in Historical Pers Perspective. Professor uh, Spogorski uh, has pre-recorded her talk, so I will play the recording now. So let me share screen. Hi, Tani, dear colleagues and audience. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this panel and thanks for allowing me to academic event of a decade or even longer. Indeed, Tani's book offers both a fundamental interpretation and reinterpretation of a century and more of Chinese and global history and an approach inspired by Alain Badou, which draws our attention to the unescapable fundaments of modern reasoning and acting. More concretely, I would like to emphasize the following two achievements and innovations of the book. First, Tani has been reading through the theories of an age, which allows her to add Chinese thinkers to the story of modern thought. Theorists such as Yan Pu, Liang Qichao, Ho Yenzhen, Li Da, and Chu Chiu Bai appear side by side with Darwin, Spencer, Huxley, Marx, Engels, Bebel, Hegel, and Freud. Second, Based on the fundamentals she establishes, Tani is able to think things together which have been dealt with as separate entities before. These are, for instance, fields of study, such as women's studies, the history of ideas, social history, art history, etc., including all their vernacular variations. Areas of expertise, such as modern bourgeois and commercial Shanghai on the one hand, and communist theorists on the other. Temporally distant chapters of Chinese history, such as the late 19th century and the Cultural Revolution. And actors whom we had assumed to be antagonists, but who in the final analysis are informed by one and the same fundamental truth on women. These are, for instance, Marxist theorists and agents of commercial advertising, or Jiang Qing and Wang Guangmei. The book is, in a positive way, unsettling because it forces us to rethink the very fundaments of China studies and beyond. In my view, the following two points are the most urgent ones we should turn to. First, what is an area? What is China or who is China? The book works along the idea that, I quote, 
the area of area studies is not a culture or a nation or state, unquote. Actually, the book brings home to us that not only contemporaries, but also we as those who study them get all too often caught in the trap of nationalism and sovereignty. Second, what is the worth of a discipline if it tends to literally discipline us in unproductive ways? How productive are the categories and the concepts they are used to employ if they actually tend to conceal the assumptions underlying our very way of thinking and acting? I think of categories prevailing in the field of women's studies such, such as gender and sex, of concepts such as agency interests, identity, context, and of approaches such as intersectionality. Lastly, I would like to raise two questions I hope Tani can further elaborate on. First, is there more women in the Chinese case of modern thought? It sounds like, and why so? Second, what is a good strategy to remedy the most troubling characteristic of China studies? Namely, that it forces us to separate a set of problems and phenomena from their transnational entanglement and put them into a box called China. Tani has highlighted these entanglements early on, and she has also shown how they were concealed in the field of China studies. I would simply like to mention her seminal article, Colonialism's Career in Post-War China Studies, published in 1993, that is almost 30 years ago. In the event of women is yet another proof for the superiority of an approach which unpacks Chinese phenomena from the China box. The question now is, and this is where I conclude, how can we translate the achievements of this groundbreaking book into a disciplinary strategy? Okay, so that was uh, Professor Spowalski's talk. And again, we will save the two questions she asked uh, to the Q&A session later. Okay, so let me move on to the next speaker, uh, Sharon Wesky, who is a professor and the author B, author E. Branchier in political science at Allegheny College. Her research interests include Chinese feminist thought in the context of Chinese intellectual criticism, contemporary Chinese political satire, rural Chinese women's organizations, and the theoretical perspectives on alternative modernities in China. Professor Wesky is the author of Chinese Feminism Faces Globalization, and she is also the co-editor of the volume, Not Just a Laughing Matter, Interdisciplinary Approaches to Political Humor in China. So Professor Wesky, please take your time. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm very honored to be here today. I'm a little bewildered by it. Um, so thank you so much. It's been many years since I've seen Tani and I'm really thrilled to be here with all of you today, <laughs> um, even if it's just on Zoom. Um, I wanted to um, start by saying that what I say here today really reflects my own daily existence as someone who teaches political science at a small liberal arts college. Um, and my desire to think more as a theorist working in a normative register and how that produces a certain amount of, of ambivalence and ambiguity in how I think about my work and my teaching. Um, I think what Nicola just said about disciplines disciplining us was very apt <laughs> in the case of how I think about my own discipline, um, especially as political science becomes kind of more and more kind of very empirical in nature. And I really kind of resist that <laughs> in lots of ways. Um, I wanna thank Tani for very clearly defining event at the very beginning of the book um, and then defining it repeatedly through the book. Um, my own experience of reading the book was I printed out the PDF and put it in this binder and then it just kind of sat pointlessly on my desk for quite a while and then I also read it over winter break and then I and then I reread what I underlined yesterday and I have to say that rereading what I underlined kind of brought it all together in a really helpful way um, so reading more than once is really helpful. Um, I'll also just briefly say that I am currently now um, in the process of finishing a manuscript of translations of the work of Song Xiaopeng and so, um, which hopefully will be going to the editor next week. So that's kind of where my head is right now. I don't know how that will reflect what I say today, but. Um, so Tani defining an event as a politically inspired action to install a newly discovered truth 
really leads me just to a few thoughts and kind of questions that I'd like to ask about what is political in the event of women um, in relation to three things. First, um, the politics of knowledge production and ideas of social science. Um, second, questions of human and gendered subjectivity. And third, um, the content of political struggle. So first, with social science and the politics of knowledge production. Um, thinking about in the event of women in relation to social scientific methods and protocols. Um, so Tani says on page two, also the event of women is the political determination that in human social existence, women are men's equivalent because physiological sexual reproduction is true. Um, how does framing this as a truth, even if it is as, even as it is demonstrably so, um, privilege or foreground certain dimensions of human existence and not others? Um, how can we consider how this claim relates to other dimensions of what it means to be human, much less female or woman? Um, how does the truth of the embodied nature of ourself, I really liked Susie talking about embodiment, um, relate to what might be seen as other political or ideological truths? Um, how does this shape other dimensions of subjectivity? Um, in political science in particular, in social science, there's the long standing like debate about agency and structure and Political science has kind of finally landed on institutionalism as the answer to that question, I think in certain ways, which I don't always agree with, but, or don't necessarily agree with at all. But, um, you know, I really appreciated Tani's work in emphasizing voluntarism in her work and how she thinks about this. Um, noting that the problematic, as she sees it, of choice versus prim uh, primal instincts and vernacular so sociology, and Susie addressed some of this in her comments as well. Um, is this always what happens, right? This kind of dilemma when the empirical becomes ideological. Um, what happens to normative questions in an epistemological world that emphasizes scientism? Um, also with respect to the event and thinking about method, um, Tani noted um, that on page six, every once in a while a wager is thrown and a truth proposed that lies beyond these normative conditions. That is how an event is triggered. And so her theory of the event of humans acting inside their real conditions. Um, I have to confess the only body you have ever tried to read is the communist idea. And um, in that he talks about um, sub subjectivation. Um, and so the question of, you know, how is a subject formed? And this will lead to my second point as well. Um, how with respect to method, right? How do concrete political subjects regard the graphesis, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, so central to this book's methodology. How did it shape their identities and their activism and the event itself of women? Um, is there a potential theoretic, theoretical or ontological contradiction between the truth that humans live in societies and the physiological truth about women? Um, how does, and how does feminism in various forms seek to resolve those contradictions, right? If we live in society, how are we socially created? through our phys physiology, I guess would be one way to think about that question. And I think this sort of relates also, um, this relates to my second question, which is questions of um, political subjectivity and feminism. Um, reading this book in relation to the question of women in Chinese feminism, Tani's previous book, of course. Um, most of the voices in this book, as I read it, were male voices. Um, how does that, what does that tell us about female political subjectivity? Um, she writes that Marxist and vernacular sociologists, legal reformists and Marxist and bourgeois nationalists shared the expectation that modern Chinese women had a right to life, liberty, autonomy, and self-awareness in service to the state, it's page 183. But you know, as noted in the book, these groups had very different ideas of what this meant. Um, and so there's multiple truths here. Um, and um, so the event of women, you know, is it itself a multiple of ideas? of the meaning of woman itself or of social justice and how did this impact the subjectivities of women who are its targets? And even the question of where she writes about, um, so scientific language reform and mobilization of the event of women into revolutionary goals are fundamental singularities characterizing Chinese conditions in the event of women. Um, are these two singularities potentially at odds with one another in certain ways? Um, and how does that relate, right? The commodity form on the one hand and revolutionary action on the other. Um, and this kind of, um, I think, relates also to what Rebecca said, right? How are events commensurable or not, or what are whether, whether events are commensurable. And so this um, leads to my third kind of major point um, relating to capitalism and colonialism and socialist feminism and the content of political struggle. Um, as I read the book, at least, <laughs> it centers the importance of capital and capitalism 
and how they insinuate themselves into every time and kind of time and space. So for example, the centering of trade and finance capital to comprehend how the event of women unfolded. Um, and this idea, um, Tani's observation, the importance of this observation that history is material. Um, but you know, in terms of these ads, which is really fascinating, and I do think captures the sort of insinuation of capitalism, how were these ads read by their targeted audience? Um, and this le leads me to the, um, actually to the uh, article in Susie's issue of positions by John Knight, right, about um, the modern girl as a communist. How did modern girls identify with the proletarian move women's movement? What led them to identify with this movement rather than just wanting to buy, buy shit all the time, I guess, um, <laughs> if they could afford it. Um, and so this relates to this question of subjectivity, but also to the question of political struggle. Um, and for me, this also just in thinking about very contemporary questions, um, a re recent article in Critical Asian Studies, What is Made in China Feminism by um, Angela Xiaowu and Yika Dong, one of whom was at NYU, maybe Rebecca, you know her, um, on Me Too and other aspects of popular feminism in China that seem to be rooted in questions of sexuality in the body. But this article makes the really tantalizing argument that this occurs in the context of class anxiety in the marriage market. And so um, the event of women, women here discuss, occurs in relation to commercial capitalism and colonial modernity, contemporary feminism, how it exists in relation to state capitalism is, is something that I think is really important to think about. And the, the vital question of how we understand body and sexual politics in relation to capitalism. Um, and so of course the chapter six of this book shows the cost of invocating female identity with commodity culture for at least the cost for Wang Guangmei. Um, and sort of the necessity and the hazards of, of doing this. And so I'll just kind of end by, um, with a couple more quotes, um, the question of the relation of the event of women and feminist struggles for justice remains open, um, page 14. I'd love to talk about this more today. Um, how does this advance feminist struggles for justice as the event of women is depicted here? Um, and I'll just end with the um, He and Jen's question as raised by Tani on page 66. If I am a natural woman mammal, then how should I act ethically and socially? Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Wasaki, for your remarks and the questions, as you are from the only one from political science. We really appreciate your uh, input. So our next speaker is Professor Zhong Xueping. Uh, she is Professor of Chinese Literature and the Culture in the Department of International Literary and the Cultural Studies at Tufts University. Her publications include Masculine Besieged, Issues of Modernity and Male Subjectivity in Chinese Literature of the Late 20th Century, and Mainstream Chinese Refocused, television, drama, society, and the production of meaning in the reform era China. Professor Zhong has co-translated and co-edited the revolution and its narratives uh, with uh, Professor Kao on this uh, round table. And her other co-edited volumes include Some of Us Chinese Women Growing Up in the Mao Era, two volumes of cultural and the social transformations and debating the socialist legacy and the capitalist globalization in China. Professor Zhong, please. Um, thank you, Ping, for inviting me uh, to join the panel. Uh, I actually have to say I uh, had to read uh, the introduction twice, unlike uh, Rebecca, <laughs> in order to uh, really sort of prepare uh, reading the rest of the book. But in any case, congratulations uh, to Tani for the uh, publication of, uh, of the book. Um, and uh, I... Uh, I have to say, I don't know whether I'm, you know, uh, really in a position at the moment uh, to say, you know, very much about um, uh, a lot of the scattered thoughts that I had uh, over uh, the reading uh, of uh, and rereading of the of the book. Uh, but uh, I'll try. But uh, in any case, in fact, uh, it sort of as Professor Ito was speaking, I was reminded of uh, when I came to know <laughs> uh, uh, Tani, that would have been like, I don't know, twice as long. 40 before, years ago. Yeah, more than 40 years. I, I think about 40 years, right? And, uh, I, and I was an undergraduate uh, student and, uh, uh, and, and Tani was uh, at, um, in our school teaching us, uh, I think, uh, something about American literature. I read a lot of American literature. <laughs> right. Stay ahead of you guys. <laughs> 
right. And then, and I also remember uh, after I graduated, I, we, I was uh, working at the Foreign Affairs Office at the university. And you, uh, there's one conversation you had with me having to do with uh, a film uh, <laughs> about, uh, uh, it's called Dang, Dang Dai Ren, uh, uh, or modern, modern person or something about uh, how some women uh, in the in the film were um, uh, captured, and you were quite taken by how they the the, the mise en scène, <laughs> which is the costume that they were wearing. You know, this one sort of some uh, uh, sleeveless uh, blouses. A lot of women in China during the Cultural Revolution or uh, shortly after that were wearing, and you were kind of quite taken by that. And I thought that was very strange because it was so normal. <laughs> it was just everybody was wearing that in the summer. So, so it was a kind of, a, and that actually stuck with me, that uh, conversation. Must, uh, it, it must have something uh, to do with the larger, maybe some larger <laughs> implications. Uh, but in any case, I thought this was uh, an interesting um, me for me to actually for the first time think back at something that I had taken as uh, being very normal and so on. So that was a, an interesting moment. I was reminded of that. But uh, what I actually uh, wanted to say, uh, maybe a bit too much, but uh, so I'm, uh, but still very scattered. So I was just, uh, I was going to maybe uh, say something about the notion of the event and then also uh, the notion of women in the title of your book. And, uh, and, and I actually have to say, when I, I, I actually read the book with increasing appreciation all the way to the, to the end. It was uh, because the, the introduction was very, uh, I don't know how to put it, it was a bit sort of bit baffling to me and sent me all the way back to uh, Badiou. <laughs> <laughs> trying to understand, uh, review uh, the notion of uh, the event. But I think uh, the reading experience was very helpful uh, 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 for me. So I would have to say that um, uh, the, the experience of reading and rereading uh, in a way uh, helps generate uh, more uh, response and more uh, sort of um, maybe also observations and questions. But but I understand uh, the Atani's use of the concept of uh, event, of course, as informed by Baidu. Uh, and but but in your book, uh, uh, your effort is actually more historical, if I can put it that way, uh, trying to pin down the notion of the event on the uh, you know the line of uh, Baidu's, but by uh, by further pointing. Uh, out uh, what cannot be known is what is most urgent <laughs> to know, uh, uh, what really matters uh, politically and existentially. So I thought that was a, a, a good reminder um, to, to try to understand uh, the notion of the event, uh, rather than just uh, in a sort of more uh, abstract way that uh, Baidu keeps at it. Uh, <clears throat> But at the same time, I think the event also, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry, this is your quote. I'm going to jump through this. But it has been you know, uh, years since I heard about and read some of uh, Tani's work on the modern girl. Um, and I thought the book does an uh, excellent job conceptualizing, which you actually also say the, you know, the disparate uh, materials, uh, trying to uh, put them, uh, into uh, a kind of a, a way, a generative way, I think, uh, to sort of in which the ephemera contains the social uh, is explained. And I, uh, and I, I think um, uh, the, especially also, uh, I would have to say to, uh, to uh, historicize that, uh, within the context of the treaty port. This, I, mean, I think I read the treaty port modernity, uh, which I think is actually an important uh, uh, historicizing of the, the event in question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the interpretive uh, 
interpretative intervention, uh, as you call uh, your book, uh, to uh, recognize and sustain endeavors. Um, sort of uh, uh, in the book uh, makes visible some of the mediational and constitutive forces that were nevertheless, uh, but at the same time, that were nevertheless being pulled into, I, I think, if I, I, if I understand correctly, into a, a, a certain direction, uh, a kind of a, you know, colonial modernity kind of a uh, uh, manifestation, if you will. Um, the historical specificity in that sense uh, uh, would then anticipate uh, for future struggles, I suppose, over uh, the truth of women um, in the revolutionary uh, China and uh, for that matter, in the post-revolutionary transformations in China. And so, so in that sense, I, I would say, uh, in the in in the book, uh, I at least we can find the sort of uh, the the constitutive forces of the event of women um, to be more modernizing than revolutionizing. If I if I if I can put put it that way, uh, although mixed with revolutionary possibilities, uh, if that's the sort of the the way to for me to understand uh, uh, the discussion in the book, and and I think the two strengths. Uh, sort of the modernizing and then the revolutionizing uh, coexist in the book. Um, I, and I, I think in some ways I appreciate therefore um, the, the book begins with Wang Guangmei uh, <laughs> and ends with, it, with that. Uh, it, it, it is, is important. Uh, it makes the discussion of the event of women of the treaty port, uh, you know, modernity to be far more, uh, uh, I would say, generative, uh, tension filled uh, and dynamic, as well as open ended in, in that sense. And then sort of, um, so, so that's how I read uh, in a way, uh, something about the notion of event uh, within the contextual or historic, uh, historically specific uh, context, but but I do have uh, some questions regarding the notion of women, <laughs> and and I think um, <clears throat> this is a little bit difficult because I think we all, as as feminist theories or you know various kinds of theories, have actually you know debated given us uh, many many uh, different kinds of debates. Uh, so it's hard to ask really some basic questions, but, but I, I think I will still try to ask uh, uh, so some very basic questions. Uh, essentially, uh, if, if the event of women um, having to do with the idea of women uh, and truth of women being struggled over and so on, uh, how, in what ways um, do women <laughs> uh, themselves, uh, whatever that means, uh, yeah, I, I just said I'm actually, uh, yeah, I need to uh, pay attention to time. So, so women themselves uh, as part of the, uh, the, the event or whatever you call it, uh, how, how, do that, uh, how does that actually figure into our, our sort of uh, debates and uh, <laughs> thinking about why is it important to, to talk about women? Right? Because I, I, I would assume that it must have to do with, it, with women themselves. And so, 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 I, I, so that's the, I don't know if I make it uh, clear because I can read it, but I'm not going to uh, just put it as a question uh, uh, here. Um, maybe um, I have something else, but I think I'm out. <laughs> I'm over, uh, running over time. So I'm just going to stop here. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Professor Zhong. Uh, yeah, I I did say, I ask her to ask one question first because we're a little bit uh, behind the time. Uh, but thank you so much. I also read the introduction twice because the first time I felt like I did not understand it at all. So, my, uh, but now I now I do. I really really appreciate it. And I am actually the last speaker on this roundtable. So I am associate professor of Chinese literature at the University of Oklahoma, and I'm the author of Gender and Subjectivities in Early. 20th century Chinese literature and the culture, the, and the co-editor of Maoist Laughter and uh, the new volume Feminisms with Chinese Characteristics. Professor Zhong and Professor Spowalski are both uh, contributors of this volume. And actually, Professor Wasoki also wrote a blurb for this volume. So uh, <laughs> glad we are all meeting here again. And um, so um, putting together this, this round table and reading Tani's new book was one of the greatest ways to spend my time in 2021 amidst a global pandemic that has left people wonder about the direction of human history. I feel like reading this book is like a treasure hunt experience. The book not only offers an intervention in gender and women's studies, it also redefines many disciplines at the same time. It provides a radically different approach to look at modernity, commodity culture, social sciences, and gender in a holistic way. A fundamental question that gender and women's studies scholars face is, what is woman? The, uh, we, we all know that Lacan uh, said, famously said, woman does not exist, which means the identification of woman is second-handed based on what she lacks. But Tony Ballo's book shows that women is not simply the effect of naming or imagination based on difference or exception. The, the woman is not a discursive construction, but a universal and a tangible thing in material history. And Balo locates modern womanhood in the infrastructure of in, in the infrastructure of corporate imperialism in the book. The assertion that, as I quote, the woman is a thing on page 14, moves gender studies from the realm of re uh, superstructure, by superstructure, I mean ideology, language, and representation, to the realm of infrastructure which means what is materialized via the complex network of financial capital, transnational corporations, and the commercial ephemera. All these things can be tangibly traced, and Ballo's book has shown uh, that concrete connections between the construction of modern womanhood and the deployment of corporate imperialism in China. Modern Chinese thinkers like He Yingzhen, Li Dazhao, and Li Da had located gender injustice in the economic institution of private property. Balo's book has shown that the possibilities of both gender justice and gender injustice have already been uh, present in the capitalist infrastructure. And the materialization of modern womanhood was part and parcel of the ongoing infrastructure revolution. Therefore, the question, what is woman? possesses the historical revolutionary potential beyond what cano canonical Marxism can explain. So canonical Marxism would revolve around livelihood or class struggle, but this is something new we are seeing in this monograph. And the second thing is I feel, uh, I found uh, the book sifts through the dredges of history to show us with indisputable evidence that work, the, the working of corporate imperialism in early 20th century China we see that capitalism and the knowledge that is associated with the capitalist mode of production extricated women from the traditional gender ideology by making her a natural and a universal human who can desire, labor, uh, and reproduce. In other words, who can be integrated into the new capitalist social and the material networks. In early 20th century China, the physiological, natural, right-bearing women uh, were overdetermined by the capitalist commercial culture. Hence, she was materialized as the avatar of commodity and again portrayed as the other of men. As Balo showed us in commercial ephemera, women were allegedly uh, alleged to be physiologically and psychologically different from men. However, because the event of women is a long and unresolved political and historical process. We should not feel frustrated by some setbacks as history zigzags forward. This book is empowering because it delivers the message that anyone, including men or women, producers or consumers, 
can recognize and install the truth of women. The historical mission of forging ahead in the event of women thus lies in every one of us. So this is uh, what I want to say about this book. And with that, we have concluded all uh, eight remarks on this roundtable, and we have about 70 minutes for the Q&A session. Uh, uh, some questions have been put on the table already. So I'd like to ask uh, Professor Balo, would you like to choose some questions to answer in the next few minutes? I would be delighted to. And I can't tell you how exciting this has been for me. Um, I feel already exhausted. That won't stop me from talking, of course, but I feel very exhausted by my effort to take in all of these ideas and responses. And I want to thank you very, very much for undertaking the hardship that I inflicted on you over the, the spring, uh, over the winter break. Um, now, uh, I'll go backwards, I think. Uh, um, Ping, you, you asked me in our written exchange whether I thought that it would take a revolutionary effort to uh, succeed in emancipating uh, and freeing women. And I answered, yes, I do believe that. I want to say in response to some of the comments and some of the questions posed that I call this book in the event of women because I don't think it's over. I think it really is a struggle. And the um, uh, I'll get to the issue of temporality a little bit later. But one of the ways that I try to mark historical time is by a, 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 um, making an implicit argument that what has what started a century ago is going to take another century or two. It's really only in the middle now. We're in the event and um, I, I know that we are also in discussing uh, Professor Ito uh, Ruri's um, uh, written responses. One of her questions was uh, she 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 wanted to raise the issue so very important now in Japanese academic feminist circles of um, uh, intervention in uh, conception uh, the and uh, reproduction. This is a, a a debate, and Ruri can speak to that herself. Um, but I wanted to take up her issue to argue that as in a sense, what we see now uh, is the capacity for fetal uh, interference, that is fetal surgery, we can freeze conceptus, we can transfer DNA from one body to another. In other words, what is has classically been determined through Darwinian uh, philosophy to be male and female is by no stretch of the imagination going to be what that is in 40 years, in my view. So both the biological, using that word just as a shorthand, both a physiological uh, notion of the distinction between male and female, the reproductive burdens on women, um, and the issues of, of inter human intervention in human reproduction are going to, and I have already altered what it is to be male and female. Um, since the period that I'm talking about, that is the, the 1890s through the 1950s. Um, so um, that's why, and, and uh, I'll address this issue of politics also through the problem of temporality. That is why it seems to me that um, it is possible to agree uh, with um, continental philosophers who are very, very picky about how they understand history. Uh, many of them do not accept um, what we understand to be social history or even uh, 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 gender history, for example, because they don't understand the vegetative flow of human life to be intrinsically um, historical. That being said, I don't agree with them. <laughs> I really don't agree with them at all. 
Um, the question then becomes, in the history of women, since we know that humans come in so many different packages, always have, always will, um, in that case, uh, how, how would we mark the existence of women? Now, the, the question of the physiological, physiological discovery of anatomical difference. That is a very important discovery. It may or may not end up proving to be true in all cases. We are in the middle of a trans outbreak. I have no doubt in my mind that men will succeed one day in carrying fetuses. Um, I myself expect that women will, will not carry fetuses, in the future, because that will be done by machines. In other words, what I'm looking at is a discrete historical set of facts. Consequently, that the what was discovered as being true physiological difference is still debatable. It is a not a, a stationary truth. That being said, it is not possible always to track the beginning and the end of a story. And that's why narrativity for me is a problem. I can only tell the story if it has an end. And in my view, it does not. Now, uh, how do I get around this problem? That's why I give us a, um, a fight. That is to say the last chapter of the book uh, goes into infinite detail about the implications of who these people were. But it's a very simple plot. It's a fight over what it means to be female. I believe that this goes to Sharon's questions as well. Uh, it truly cannot be, the history of women cannot be uh, contained within one, within political science or within the the vocabulary of agency, which I find really distracting. Um, pretty much, uh, I, as you point out, I substitute the term voluntarism. Um, and I believe that this is both a Bedouin, but also a Maoist way of thinking about history. The people do think, the people do act. In that, in that way, um, there, there is, uh, a measuring, I look to measure um, what it is that the people do in the event of women shows two very powerful women representing various forms of thinking about womanhood and what is appropriate for women, having a really terrible and violent fight, which in the end killed them both. So uh, you wanted to use that fight uh, as a transitive, it's in the event of women, not outside of, or there was an event and now it's over. It's in transition as we make our way. This to me also, uh, volunteerism is extremely optimistic. While the story that I tell and uh, teach is deeply um, traumatic, uh, most of the people I write about in this book were killed or died of disease or warfare. Um, still in all, uh, the possibilities uh, that are linked to the understanding that um, we act under circumstances not of our own making with the hope that our truths will hold true. That is, that is what I'm talking about. Now, um, let me go back to more specific uh, um, issues. Um, I really wanted to um, address uh, Xi Jinping's um, issue of the constitutive versus the revolutionary. And I think that's really insightful. Um, I myself am really torn on this issue uh, because to, to measure the revolutionary or to measure uh, action, it seems to me that I have to understand the constituted. Um, since I don't believe that context is an appropriate um, historical fallback position, um, and I do believe that 
intuitive elements are important. Um, I take a gamble that that the the uh, materials that I examine carefully are going to lead me in a more generalizing way. They also become background for assertions that I make as a historian. This makes me, <laughs> uh, you know, um, it, it, the the um, voluntarist historian. And um, I take very seriously the Benjaminian, of course he wasn't a professional historian, but he did declare himself to be a historian. And in Benjamin's view, history is something that we fight over. So we have a fight. Uh, the Nazis are all around us. I used to say to my mom, uh, mom, what should I do when the, if the Nazis come back? And she would say, well, just tell them you're Jewish and then fight them. And I, I used to think, why would I tell them I'm Jewish? That it seems like a counterintuitive thing to do. But the Nazis are back now. <laughs> um, so how to figure out what, where to put energy, I think, depends on the constitutive elements. Um, and historians can look at how people caught in, in certain circumstances, either were forced in decisions or simply made decisions voluntaristically. Um, I think that Nicola's uh, point about area is extremely well taken. And I think we all struggle with this. Um, uh, she poses the question that has bedeviled me and perhaps it bedevils her as well. She says, um, was the woman question more central to the Chinese revolution than it was say um, in the Russian revolution or the French revolution? And I think, yes, the answer is yes. And the question of why, I have no idea. I keep puzzling. I ask my students, look at all these films, look at the history of the Chinese Communist Party, look what they did. Why is this so central to what they did? Whether it was successful in the long run, this is, I refuse to make comments on that, on that question. But the centrality of the concern, even when, when oppression is clearly uh, a part of political government programs, um, it still is a question that, that for me is quite open. Um, let's see. Um, now let's go to the question of, oops, there it is, okay. Uh, I wanted to say one other thing about uh, the importance of Japan in my intellectual um, makeup. Uh, it was the first time, and uh, because Rui interpreted for me, uh, I, it was the first time that I was uh, inside a multilingual um, community of people who were focused on similar problems. So I learned that, um, that there was such a thing as trilingualism, Ruri herself is competent in five languages, but most Japanese scholars that I met there uh, also spoke Korean, um, a European language, English, and so on. Uh, and many spoke Japanese, I mean Chinese, and there were many Japanese scholars that I speak to in Chinese as our common language. This was a real eye-opener for me, and I think it has fed into my desire to make sure that our feminism and our intellectual lives are as polylingual and uh, multi, multiple as that um, now idealized um, experience that I had in Tokyo. Thanks very much to Rui. Now, um, to Rebecca's frustration, yes. Uh, Yes, indeed. Um, this is an architectonic method. Uh, it, I think if I think about how I got to this space, it has to be because I trained with social historians. I am quite naturally oriented toward ab abstraction. I'm an intellectual historian, despite years of working with um, advisors 
and the majority of the field of history, which is social history. I take social historians extremely seriously because I think they have a point that uh, it's in the world of objects um, and social life uh, that ideas come to fruition. So um, this uh, fragmentation is an effort, I think, um, it's a solution to the problem of um, claiming uh, a kind of spectacular vision into historical. I don't think that, um, I think that where ideas uh, originate, how we develop these ideas, um, is deeply rooted, and I know you hold this belief yourself, is deeply rooted um, in experience uh, and uh, the, the historical moment, um, what we inherit from thinkers in the past. Um, and I very much uh, accept and promote the idea that a good historian can present rather than represent. And I think that's where you and I probably will, will um, have the most degree of distance. Um, I, I hesitate to represent in such a way that my histories become automatically historiographical before they're even published. So I, I, I'm sorry to become so abstract in my, in my thinking, but it seems to me that um, the risk of being wrong um, has presented itself to me often. Um, and so uh, my desire to see uh, as much of the conflict that led to this problem as to shine a, a very, very, um, in my view, overly ambitious spotlight uh, on the story of its truth. Um, I don't think that narrative um, and time can be collapsed together. I don't think that narrativity is the story of time. Um, we know from modernist studies and from literary uh, um, writing that uh, time goes in, in, in profusion, not in any one direction. Um, and we know more through brain science that that's how we actually are able to think. So um, in all of these ways, uh, um, I think that that the issue of collapsing temporality, narrativity, and logic together can actually pose a problem for history. I hope that I've addressed some of the rich issues that you have all raised. If there's something else that I should address right now, please let me know. You've addressed many of the important and hard questions, and thank you very much, Tarni. And uh, due to the time <laughs> concern, we will have to end tonight here. And I really appreciate all your input and uh, Tarni for answering all the questions. And this book was uh, uh, like uh, this book is so wonderful, and I appreciate the opportunity for being the presider of this wonderful panel. So uh, I think we'll leave all the other questions for next year or another occasion, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I look forward to our next meeting, you know, either uh, virtual or in person, but whatever it is. But uh, thank you so much.